This morning we turn to the epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 4. And we are reading from verse 11, where Paul speaks of Christ's gift to the church of pastors and teachers, Ephesians 4.11, for the perfecting of saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4, from verse 11 through to verse 13. At the beginning of chapter 4 of this epistle, Paul moves from an emphasis on doctrine to an emphasis on practice. And he is saying from chapter 4, verse 1 onwards, that the grand facts of our holy faith have been set out in the earlier chapters of this epistle and now Christians must be taught and encouraged to live in accordance with those truths. So walk worthy, he says, of the vocation wherewith ye are called. This will involve evidencing the graces uh, which will increase and preserve, he says, the unity of the Spirit in the church, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, verse 3, in the bond of peace. And in order for that to be achieved, he goes on to say that the ascended Christ has bestowed a variety of gifts uh, to his church, including the gift of teaching pastors. And the purpose of such a gift is, he says, the perfecting of the saints. Verse 12. That means the development of the Lord's people development of them in godliness and in holiness. And Paul adds that each individual Christian ought therefore to develop and to grow up until, he says, and this is really our text, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the Christian's goal is maturity. And a help is given to us in the ministry of God's word to advance us to that goal so that we are all to grow up to be a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, which seems to mean uh, to have the excellence which Christ himself possesses. Now in these verses, we, we notice uh, a reference to the perfecting of the saints in verse 12. And the word in the Greek means the completing or the fitting of the saints so that they grow and reach maturity. And this is to the end that we may reach what Paul calls here in verse 13, a perfect man. And that means a mature man. 
sometimes in scripture that word perfect does appear. Not that anybody in this life, whatever his state, however developed is his faith, can actually achieve absolute perfection. But the word means that he may advance to what he should be, that he may reach a, a, a place of maturity in the Christian life. And so one of the things Paul emphasizes throughout the epistles is that we are to, to do everything we can to grow up spiritually, to reach spiritual manhood, and to be like Christ himself. So Paul writes, for example, in uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 20, uh, be no longer children, he says, but in understanding be men. In other words, have a mature outlook on life guided by the word of God. And again in Hebrews 5, 14, he says to the people he's addressing in that epistle, don't be children always feeding upon milk or the simple things of the truth of God, but grow up and have a relish for the meat of God's word, a solid doctrine. So whatever you look in the New Testament, there is this emphasis that we're all young at first and somewhat immature, but we are to leave that behind. And the longer we live as Christians, uh, the more grown up we should be in every way. So it's spiritual maturity that I'm thinking about this morning. What it is, how we reach it and attain to it, what a difference it makes to our lives. Spiritual maturity. I notice that this growth to spiritual maturity is illustrated in the Word of God in, in several different ways, using several different figures or emblems. For example, it's likened to a child growing up from infancy. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, as newborn babes, he's talking about them spiritually, they've recently been born again, they're new Christians, as newborn babes, he says, desire the pure word of God that you may grow thereby. You mustn't think that you will remain forever in this infant state, but God wills that you should grow. So that's one figure, a baby growing up into boyhood or girlhood, and then further to manhood or womanhood. He is another figure in the Gospel of Mark and chapter 4 in one of the parables of Christ. Mark 4, 26, so is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn. And the fruit is brought forth. And what Christ is saying is it's like that in, in the spiritual realm. It's like that in the church of God. The sower, ultimately Christ himself, the, the, in a secondary sense, the minister, is sowing the seed, preaching the word of God. 
the ground is uh, the hearers to whom uh, this ministry comes. The seed hopefully finds a place in the hearts of the hearers. And then there is uh, a pleasing growth because the word takes hold of our hearts and it produces a Christian, a strong Christian, hopefully at the end, uh, an, a mature Christian person. But Jesus says there, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn, the mature, the mature grain is uh, the ultimate thing which appears. So again, it's stressing maturity, using the emblem of a plant in the field. Another illustration of it, passing from babies to um, plants in the field, Another illustration of it is a building which is under construction. And at the end of Matthew 7, you'll be aware of those familiar words when Christ concludes the Sermon on the Mount and he says, uh, there are two kinds of men. One is a foolish man, he builds his house upon the sand when challenging weather comes and when the tempest swirls around it, of course, because there's no foundation, the, the whole thing collapses. But a wise man, he says, builds his house upon the rock, meaning his life. He builds his life upon the rock of God's word. Such as I have brought to you, he says. And then when uh, adverse circumstances come and when great tests come in life, uh, he's not blown away by it. He doesn't lose everything because he's been careful to build upon the rock of the Lord and of his word. Now, in the building of a house, there is the initial stage. You might pass in a car, uh, a new estate going up, and you, you see that one day they've just laid the foundation. And then you, you pass by another day and you see that the walls are beginning to rise. And yet still it's fearfully incomplete. And then you, you pass by some weeks or months later and the roof is on and the windows have been put in and it's a house now, recognizably a house. So it passed from a stage when it wasn't really ready and didn't look like a house to the point that it was ready and it was habitable. So it's grown from just a few bricks to a house with many bricks and has reached a kind of maturity. Now Christ uses that. He, he speaks in another place of uh, a man building a tower. This is Luke 14, 28 to 30. And he says, when you want to build a tower, he's talking about building a, a life for yourself, you, you sit down and you count the cost, whether you're prepared to do this and to see it through. But when you build a tower, of course, it's the initial stage, fearfully incomplete, but then there's the final stage when it is recognizably a tower and it's reached it, it, its full height and uh, the work has been completed or practically completed upon it, maturity. And so it's with these sort of emblems and these sort of figures that the Word of God explains we've got to grow like an infant grows, like a plant grows, like a building grows. Uh, 
the end has got to be uh, maturity. We've got to complete what we've begun. So spiritual maturity is the theme. Now, let me make some points and then let us look at what maturity really is. First of all, let me make the point that all Christians should grow to spiritual maturity. It is God's will for us to go on and to grow up. So we have exhortations to that in the New Testament. Let us go on, Paul writes to the Hebrews. And another place speaks of us as growing up in him, increasing with the increase of God. Colossians 2.19. So we can say it is God's purpose so to do. And then secondly, there are commands to that effect and to that end. So when Peter concludes his second letter and he says, grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grow. It's a command which is issued from God above. And if we are really changed and if a good work has begun in us, that is what will be the natural order of things that we'll seek to develop as a Christian. We don't want always to be in a, a sort of embryonic, undeveloped state. We want to be a real Christian, recognizably so. And so the grace of God teaches us that what has begun when we're first converted is only the beginning. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it or will go on performing it until the day that Jesus returns, the day of Christ. So his purpose is that we grow up. His command is that we grow up. And his work in us is evidently so that we can grow up. It's a beginning, but it's not the end. We got to move toward the end of maturity. The second thing I want to say briefly is this, that it's, it's possible to grow up and to develop and to become strong as a Christian. Despite all that's against us and all the difficulties we face, it's possible because we have a, a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and from him comes the wherewithal to go on. In John 15, he likens himself, Christ does, to a vine and his disciples are like branches in the vine. And that's the secret of their growth because they're drawing on the sap. And the nourishment of the vine in order to bear leaves and to bear fruit in the end. Now we are, as Christians, we are united to Christ and we live by faith. We, we, we live drawing on his resources. And he gives us new life and he gives us new strength. And he's supplying us with the wherewithal to 
grow up and to proceed to a measure of strength and stability in life. It's possible for us to do this because of the influences of the Spirit. In Isaiah chapter 44, we have a, a striking verse there. In verse 3, speaking of the effusion of the Spirit, he says, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour out my Spirit upon thy seed and my blessing on thine offspring, and they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the watercourse. So the Spirit of God helping us and assisting us to grow up, we have that clearly supplied to us. And then we have the Word of God and prayer. The Word of God is likened to dew upon the dry ground in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 2. And that helps us to grow every time we hear a godly sermon, we are encouraged and directed to advance in the Christian life. That's what it's all about. And prayer is another help. At one point in the Gospels, uh, the disciples came to Jesus. It's in Luke 17 and verse 5. And, and this is their prayer to him, their, their request. Increase our faith. They knew that it was a matter for which they should pray and God's answer would enable them to increase in faith. So it is possible to grow because of our union with Christ, because of the influences of his spirit, because of the ordinances of the Word of God and prayer, yes, it's possible to grow. The third thing to say is that it will take time. Take time. Especially if we're thinking of growing to the full measure, if we're thinking of growing to maturity. It will take time. In the parables Jesus taught, he speaks of spiritual life as very small at the beginning. It's like a seed. And uh, it's like a, a small seed, a mustard seed. One of the smallest of the seeds. And it's going to take time for that seed uh, to really reach what it should be. Whether it be a uh, great plant or whether it be a great tree, it'll take time. So there's no quick fix in the Christian life. People used to talk, not so much today because they've learned to be wiser, I think, but going to a certain place, a convention or something, and getting the blessing and being sanctified at the meetings as if a sermon or a particular experience at those meetings will do the trick. So suddenly we'll grow up overnight. It doesn't work like that. I'll tell you how long it takes. It takes a whole lifetime to reach spiritual maturity. And that is why uh, Paul speaks as he does here of, of Christians growing growing gradually until we come to a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's our end, to be like Christ. It'll take us all the years of our life to attain to that and to reach any degree of maturity. And it will take even more than that because 
Scripture speaks of the doctrine of glorification when at the end of life or when our Lord returns, the defects are made up and what we haven't been able to develop properly will be developed at the coming of the Lord and at the appearing of the Lord. Well, it will take time. But it is recognizable, that's the third point, that our signs of it. When we discern that our, our graces, our faith is stronger, our hope is brighter, our love is more fervent, this is a, a sign that there's something going on in our lives. We're not, we're not in a rut. We're not static. There is movement and there is growth. And this is the way to discover the strength of it. It's not always clear that that growth has taken place because it's not an outward thing, you see, in this development. It's not simply outward, but it's, it's an inward thing. It's a spiritual thing. It, it's growing in holiness of heart. It's growing in God-likeness. And that isn't observable, at least not to the eyes of men, but it is happening. And we're going on. And it's our desire to grow more and more. And to reach toward the prize of the high calling of God. And to really be what we should be. So then, it is God that's working in us. And he's working in us so that we'll prove to be Christians indeed. And we'll make good of the Christian life. And we won't leave it as a job half done. But we'll follow on to know the Lord. And we're pressing on to spiritual maturity. Which brings me to this last consideration before we close this morning. What exactly is this spiritual maturity? Well, I think it's when we develop, first of all, a soundness in faith. As we grow up, we have less and less sympathy or attraction to novelties and as we grow up spiritually we know what it is to be grounded in the faith to hold the principles of the word of God In his letter to Titus, Paul says this in chapter 2. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith. That should come with years. It should certainly come with spiritual maturity. So you know when you've got a measure of maturity because you're not likely to be moved by the latest fad in the evangelical world. You know what you believe and you're grounded in the faith of God's elect. That's a sign of maturity. A second uh, 
aspect to maturity is that your devotion to Christ is deeper. Your love has grown to him and to his people. So whereas once you were encouraged, perhaps in gospel preaching, to give your heart to the Lord, and you made friends of Christian people, but as you develop, you, you realize that Jesus Christ deserves all your heart, all your life long. And if you had a thousand hearts to give him, they would be too few to show others how precious he is to you. So as you advance, you, you love him more. And you love God's people more. Now Paul, in his letter, speaks of our love abounding more and more. That's maturity. When you love him, not just attracted to him, which may have been the case at the first, but you love him. And you want more of him and you long to be with his people. So deeper devotion to Christ. The third thing is a sign of maturity is that you're wiser. Because you've had years reading and hearing the word of God. And you've had years of experience confirming the Word of God. So you should, at the end of it, be wise. And that is why in the book of Job, we have Job saying in Job 12 and verse 12, with the ancient there is wisdom. That's usually old men have learned a thing or two in life. Well, it's certainly true spiritually. With the older Christians, there should be wisdom. And so, the mature Christian is wise. He's learned more about life. He's learned how to overcome the great adversary. He's learned how to make good of bad situations. He's, he's learned how to face trouble in life and to overcome it. He's learned how to prevail even when everything seems contrary to him. He's known to be wise. And therefore, spiritual maturity means that he's highly respected. And just like scripture says that the gray-headed man should be honored spiritually, that's true that the man who's mature should be respected of his fellow men. A fourth point of spiritual maturity, I think, is serious-mindedness. Paul says in one place, when I was a child, I thought as a child. I spake as a child, and so on. But when I became a man, he says, this is 1 Corinthians 13, I put away those childish things. He's talking about maturity. He has grown up. So he's not playing games all the time. And not watching funny things all the time, as a child would love to do. But the passage of the years and the work of grace has taught him to be more serious about life, what Paul calls sober-minded. 
and he thinks about the great realities of life. How he may serve God. How he may deal with trouble. How he may live a Christian life with all consistency. He's concerned about these things. And that's a sign of maturity. And the last feature of spiritual maturity is that as a Christian goes on, he, he's more heavenly minded. He thinks about what in his youth he may never have thought about, but death and meeting with Christ and being in glory. And the more he thinks about this, the more he's weaned from the world and the things of the world. And the more concerned he is to be ready for heaven. So that he can say with Simeon in Luke 2, Now let us, thou thy servant, depart in peace. Ready he was. Ready. And the mature Christian is ready for the great change at the end of life. He's ready to be with Christ. He's ready to join the redeemed in heaven. He often thinks of it. How wonderful it will be. Of course, he has natural fears of what goes before it. But it's all swallowed up in the glory of what's afterwards. Seeing Christ. Hearing him speak to us. Having him bless us forever and forever. And so a mature man minds his final journey and thinks oft of the happiness and blessedness which await him at the end of the journey. And that's a sign of maturity. Well, this is not to exhaust the subject, friends. It's only to touch on it, but I wonder where you are. How long have you been a Christian? Have you attained to a measure of maturity? I wonder. I wonder if some of us have been long a Christian and yet we still behave like children. We're easily influenced by others. Some new fangled notion comes into the Christian world and we're on board with that. We get carried away with it. It's like a child. Hasn't life taught you anything? Has it not taught you to be stable, consistent, persevering in the faith once delivered to the saints? That's maturity. Well, my friends, let's examine ourselves and let us pray that God would work in us unto a mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And don't rest until you've made progress. Until people discern in you the marks of a growing Christian. A strong Christian. An overcoming Christian. A holy Christian. 
a serving Christian. Amen. Paul says, let us aspire to that. Turn our backs upon childhood and our faces toward growing up.